Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is the fourth uh, lecture that we gave on this theme of uh, the passage, let's say, from, uh, uh, from uh, figuration or from, let's say, even the landscape to abstract art. We'll deal today with Riopel, but Riopel never does the things like everybody else. He did the reverse. He started with abstract and end up by figurative. But in fact, you will see it's the same problem in a way uh, because there is a problem of passage and there is, a, of course, a link with uh, this concept of place that I have uh, discussed a few times already. The, uh, the coming back to figuration in Rio Pell coincide with the uh, rather disturbing, let's say, change in his technique. Uh, as you know, he, he was uh, using a lot uh, the uh, the knife uh, to, to paint this uh, heavy impastos of his most uh, known uh, picture. But then suddenly he began to use the spray can, this, <laughs> this uh, spray paint from, from cans, like uh, I would say a vulgar graffitist, uh, somebody making graffiti in the metro or on the walls of, uh, of the building all over the place. And uh, this uh, is disturbing in a way because uh, after all he had already uh, use so many uh, more conventional type of technique. And he, he, at the end of his life, he says also in interview very often things like, uh, maybe to just to shock, of course, the interviewers and us uh, indirectly, uh, there's no more painting, there's no more paint, there's no more color, uh, no more brushes, all this disappears. So come on, Mr. Riobel, go to any uh, artist material shops and you will find them. Oh yes, but they don't know how to do a right brush anymore. They, they are, they are not uh, what they should be, and, and the color is the same. So that's why I use the spray can. Of course, one of the reasons, of course, it was that it was easier to uh, to use because he suffered from arthritis and whatever uh, any f physical problem. But uh, there is this kind of uh, disturbing uh, coincidence, let's say, with this. And I must tell you uh, the truth. My first impression of these works was not very good. I entitled one of the uh, texts I wrote about uh, Rio Bell, Impression Negative. And uh, you would say <laughs> it was not my intention, but some colleagues of mine said, this is your judgment on him. He, have you make, he make on you a, a negative impression. Not exactly, you would see. Anyway, the, it's true that at first sight, uh, I was taken aback. The first time I saw that, it was in Saint-Cyr, uh, a little place near Paris. Uh, near Mont, if you want, uh, where he used to have a huge garage. And uh, you enter there, the first floor, you have maybe 20 uh, cars, uh, I mean really collection cars, uh, like uh, uh, say, uh, Ferrari and, uh, and Rolls Royce and things like that, 20 of them like this. And then you, you, you climb a little stairs and then there he was, uh, long hair, looking like a, an old shaman, I would say, uh, uh, and with a, a court around him. I had a lot of people there, a lot of drinks, and uh, discussing if anything except art, of course, discussing of who is the, the best boxer in France at the time, who is the, uh, the fastest car, and uh, subject matter that seems to be, and I was at the time with Pierre Thébert, you see, uh, uh, we were supposed to exhibit him here uh, for the opening of the, of the new wing of the museum in 1991. And uh, so all this lasted almost six hours and without any decision ma being made of what we will show, how it will be, no answer to any question, just all this r rambling. And then when we saw these things in the museum, finally, these last period works, the same impression was there because then you could confront them even with the uh, famous uh, painting of the 50s and, and of the beginning of the 60s. Huh? You go from one room to the other and then suddenly you, you end up with these last rooms. And, uh, and again, say people were asking me, uh, what do you think of the last work? Uh, me meaning that maybe it's not so good. And, and, uh, and uh, I would say I changed my mind when I saw in 1993 at Michel Tetro Gallery, the big work was called Homage to Rosa Luxembourg. Uh, uh, it, it's hard to, to show it to you because in fact it's so big, it's 40 meter long, uh, this, this piece, and it's in three sections, and at uh, Michel Tetro they have represented it 
like a, in a U shape. Right? You have three sections like this. It's now at the Museum of Quebec uh, in Quebec City uh, after a, an unfortunate uh, stay at the Casino of Hall. I, this I, maybe maybe the Opel find it funny or in, interesting, but but it was stupid, a uh, kind of stupid move. Now at least it's in a proper place in a museum. And but there. If you have visited it, you know that it's presented rather like in a Z shape, like this, the three section. Uh, they want to underline the fact that it's a kind of narrative piece, how you go from one scene to the other, and apparently each war have a signification. We don't know the signification of all of them because uh, Riopel didn't uh, really comment one by one. Uh, but we have to tell, oh, this is the, uh, it allude to the Beckett uh, show, and, and he, he will make some reference like that. So because of this narrative structure of the work, it is presented like this, like a thing that you should walk around and, and not see as a, as a whole, like in, at Michel Tetro presentation. So what I can do, I can show you in parallel a um, few details. Uh, just to give you a, a feeling of it, and I will have to come back from time to time to other aspects of it uh, during, during my talk. Uh, then, of course, when you saw that at that scale, uh, you begin to think, well, maybe it's more serious than we thought. Uh, the first painting looks a little bit uh, whimsy and, and easy, and then suddenly you see, well, this is a real masterpiece. It's a big work, and it happens to be also the last important painting of Rio Bell, as you know. Uh, it was done in 1992, and uh, then there was already a problem with the title. Uh, let's see, I want to go back here. Okay. And then here, okay, and then I think I had a, no, okay. I've just one detail, yeah, okay. Uh, then there was, there was a problem with a title, with uh, why homage to Rosa Luxembourg. Uh, uh, as you know, Rosa Luxembourg was a famous uh, socialist uh, revolutionnaire uh, before the First World War. She is also the one who created the so-called Spartacus League uh, against the government of the time, of course, against also the involvement of Germany in the war. Uh, they were pacifists, they were um, anti-nationalist also. And during the war, she was put in prison because her type of talk, of course, was uh, considered very destructive to the, what they wanted to achieve. After the war, she continued her revolutionary work and uh, was assassinated in 1919. Uh, so at first, OK, maybe uh, there's a relation to a revolutionary uh, in, in the uh, mind of uh, Riopel, but it was not very clear. But there's one thing that he said, that he wrote, he read the, uh, the letters of Rosa Luxembourg that were written during her imprisonment. During the time she was jailed, she, she uh, wrote few letters that were sent to friends, and these letters were coded, meaning that uh, under some letters there was little signs that the, uh, let's say, the censorship could not notice or, or know about. And from her prison, she was able to direct certain action and certain subversive action. And, and this, for, for, for uh, Riopel, this was very fascinating. And in a way, his own work, you will see, is a kind of coded work also. Uh, it, it's, it's a way also that, that he, he identified to that. And I was satisfied with this explanation when suddenly in the metro, uh, very recently, there's a guy who comes to me and takes me like this and he says, Monsieur Gagnon, say, have you read the letters of Rosa Luxembourg? So I was embarrassed because I didn't read uh, much of them, dropped a few, a few little commentary. And he says, do you know that she mentioned many times the passage of the wild geese in her in her letters. And indeed, this is interesting. I wish I knew his name of this poor guy. I could, I could uh, quote him in the a, in a, in a bottom of a page in a, uh, when I will publish an article on this. But he, I says, who are you? And he says, I'm just a curious man, a man of curiosity, a man with good curiosity. And he disappeared. So well, that's what happened to, uh, uh, to me in, in Metro of Montreal. But anyway. <laughs> I would certainly read the damn letters <laughs> if I, to, to find out. But the, the, uh, uh, 
if, it, if it's so, and I believe him, why not? The, uh, this team, of course, could speak to the Opel also, because, as you know, he represented so many times uh, these uh, birds and these geese and all that, so it, it could be one of the explanations. But the, the other aspect of a uh, kind of coded letter is also important because the, uh, it, is, it is a fact that we know that it was done at the time when uh, uh, somebody with whom he lived a long time, over 25 years, uh, John Mitchell, who is uh, an important American artist, was uh, uh, when he, he learned that she died. And this have, uh, prompted the elaboration of this big work. And if there is a code there, it is, of course, a work not about Rosa Luxembourg so much, but about this uh, John Mitchell that he used to call Rosa Malheur. Uh, uh, of course, by playing on word on Rosa Bonheur, wh with, which is a famous uh, feminist painter of the 19th century, you know that she was uh, painting horses. Uh, she was a uh, special, uh, specialist of the, that uh, team. And uh, so, they, they, they were a couple for 25 years, but uh, apparently very noisy and very uh, <laughs> not, not very simple. And they were throwing names at each other. She used to call him Bran Bran, uh, and as an insult, of course. Uh, they, 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 the journalists have not, have not understood that. And uh, he was calling her Rosa Malheur and, and things like that. So the homage to Rosa is, in fact, the homage to John, uh, to, to John Mitchell. And uh, so this is the the coded message, let's say, of the big work, huh? what, what, uh, what it re represents. In fact, it's it, this reaction to when he learned that she was dead. And it's, it's a person with whom he lived so long time and have so, so many souvenirs together. So he decided to make something, a kind of a rehearsal of all their common life, in a way. And indeed, when we, the, the, f the few scenes that we know about are about this theme, in fact. Huh? And uh, the. Uh, I always try to get this picture in parallel. No, it's not this one. Oh, I think it's this one. In which you see, this is one of the central motif of the homage to Rosa Luxembourg. And as you can see, it's, uh, it represents a bird, but with an arrow and a heart here. Uh, and you could see it, it's a kind of symbol of, of the death of, uh, of uh, John Mitchell. And very often you get these big circles also that are repeated all, all the time. They are like, of course, like to, to center the attention on this scene in particular, but also it's a kind of reflection of one of his eye problem at the time. He have cataract and he, he see these kind of circle things that you, you could be explained that way. But this scene in particular, I think it, it speaks well of what it is the hidden message of the homage to Rosa Luxembourg. So then after when I saw that, I said to myself, okay, how come that uh, this uh, uh, so-called spray uh, paint or, or, or spray can paint that he was used, we react so negatively at first. Huh? You, you needed to have the confrontation of his big work to, to begin to think that maybe it's not so bad after all. The first explanation I can give of that, it is a kind of nostalgia of his previous style, of course. Huh? And it is in comparison to what he was doing in the 50s in particular, that we find it less interesting or that we were more critical about it. Huh? And indeed, if you uh, put uh, together some of the work of uh, that time, uh, you, you can ask the question, I just give you a composition of the 1950 and uh, the, the circus, which is a painting that is owned by this museum uh, of uh, 1955, just to illustrate that. Of course, this is the great period. But I'm not sure that when we refer to that as the great period, we always understand exactly why it's so important and what was the issue then of this painting of the 50s at, uh, uh, in the Riopel time. And to explain that, uh, I want to go back to in the past and I will show you a few Cezanne pictures because Cezanne is really like the turning point in modern art. If we understand well what it's all about, you will see which direction that the Opel was trying to take in these type of painting. So first, let's go back to uh, uh, one of this uh, famous still life of Cezanne. And uh, at first sight, well, there's nothing to be uh, too excited about. Uh, some uh, apples on a plate, uh, a tea, uh, maybe a kind of sugar bowl, I would say, and a pitcher for a jug, milk, something like that. Uh, a kind of uh, uh, 
uh, tablecloth who seems to be uh, uh, just put there uh, without too much reason. And at first, you say, OK, there's not much to, to discuss about. But when you look at, at it more carefully, you see, you get the impression that what seems so solid at first sight in a, Cé in a Cézanne picture is, in fact, the result of many uh, small decisions from the part of the painter as if each things that is represented there was uh, decided about, uh, was not clear uh, to begin with. For instance, the fact that the, the angle of the table, if you look at the two corners here, you will realize that this table is very much folded over toward us. Uh, so much that some critic at the time used to say that all the things on the table will, will just fall on, on the floor. See? It's as if he had put little blocks on the two hind legs <laughs> in the back like this, just to present it even more to, toward us. Uh, this is the first thing that you could see. Then if you, if you look at uh, some details, like, like I, I think I showed you last time also, if you try to follow the edge of the table here, and then the edge of the table from the other direction, you will see they don't really meet. Uh, as if uh, Cezanne have kept the idea of uh, what we see from the left eye is not exactly what you see from the right eye. And the two sensations, like he used to say, I want to be faithful to my sensation, are kept as such. And this is, of course, the reason why this tablecloth make a triangle here to hide this lack of connection between both. Uh, it's not uh, by hazard that you, you have this little piece of cloth here. It is because it hides the lack of connection between the two edges. So a thing like that could be done just by using a ruler uh, and making two straight lines seems to have, in the country, uh, <laughs> be a problem for Cezanne. And he solved it in a kind of not completely uh, satisfying manner, as if the problem is there, but it's not resolved. Or it's the resolution, if there's one, is hidden. Uh, it's not really revealed. Then look at the sugar ball, and you will see, OK, normally these two uh, uh, handles on each side should be perfectly symmetrical. There's no reason that one will be more squished and the other, the other a little bit more uh, open. Uh, as if, again, this kind of symmetrical uh, form, allant de soi, if you want, is now treated in a, in a kind of a weird way. The, uh, also, the handle of the picture here is really parallel to the the surface of the painting. is not in, uh, in a proper disposition. If he was really in perspective, it would be a little bit toward us. Uh, the opening of the picture also is almost too much folded, like the table, toward us also. If it was really uh, painted in perspective, you will not see so much of inside of the picture. You will see just the, the edge, but not inside. Uh, finally, if you try to situate the, the whole table in the space there, it's not very clear either. OK, we are inside, because there is here um, a kind of maybe a, a hat holder or something. I don't know what it is, but you see feet of something there. And then you have this black uh, surface here, who could be or a part of the floor or a part of the wall. And, and there's no way to decide, really, wh which is which. Um, and it makes a kind of ambiguity of the situation of the whole scene in the space that is represented there. So the more you look at it, the more you realize that all this have been, in fact, like the process of hesitation, of decision making from the painter in order to, to what, you ask yourself, say, why not to represent the things as they are? One of the explanations, the classical explanation, I would say, uh, the Clement Greenberg type of approach to that, it is that, like a modernist, Cezanne wanted to index the surface, wanted to show you, you, us that a painting, before being the representation of a three-dimensional thing, is in fact a surface, is, an, is in fact a b-dimensional thing. And what he does, in, the in a way, it is to make a compromise between a three-dimensional representation, will be like in real uh, life, if you want, and the flatness of, of the canvas. So that's why the table is halfway uh, through, uh, let's say, in perspective, and, uh, and to be completely flat like this, to be parallel to the surface of the picture. That's why also, eventually, that the the traces that you have around the, the, the apple, the pears, and even the opening of the picture there are uh, ambiguous. It's as if you have two systems to represent it. Or you, you represent volumes. 
Uh, and then it's clear, especially the apples and, and the pears. They are clearly volumes in space, and they have a limit by themselves. Or you trace a black line around shapes to really make them stand out. Uh, there, there's a word of Cezanne who is interesting where he say les contours m'échappent. Uh, meaning the, the contour escapes me. They, I try, and you have probably seen some of his watercolor in which he repeat many lines like this of contour. I didn't bring a, a representation of that, but uh, I guess you know what I'm speaking about. As if you had uh, an hesitation of where the contour stop, where, where it should be. If it's a line on a sheet of paper, if it's the way to represent the contour of an object as a line on a sheet of paper, you affirm then the flatness of the sheet of paper. If you represent volumes in space, you make it less clear. You, you represent that three-dimensional thing. And again, you have this hesitation between those two. So as a modernist uh, painter, let's say Cezanne not only paint reality, but also made uh, a critical, or if you want, a reflection on the very act of painting. Uh, that could be one of the significations of that. But I don't think this is enough. This is going far enough. What uh, Cezanne is dealing with, and there you will see, I'm, I'm coming to Rio Bell finally with this. What is what he's dealing with, it is, I would say, the indetermination of reality. The fact that what we see is not really so well defined that we should know right away uh, what it's all about. For instance, uh, the physicists told us what is really, what is real. Uh, they tell us, for instance, that color is um, just uh, waves. Uh, uh, they tell us also that uh, any object that we see are in fact a kind of a cluster of atoms or molecules or, or uh, and of course we don't see that, but this is the reality, this is the real thing. What we see, it's real color, uh, like in, in our experience, or, or shapes, or, or form. And in a way, what we see is something that resists to this type of, de of uh, description that the scientists give us. Huh? It's what the philosopher called the choseite. I don't know how to say that in English, but it is the, the characteristic of being a thing. Huh? A thing resists to this type of analysis that scientists can do by presenting itself as color, as form, and it's exactly, of course, at that level that the painter deals with reality. Uh, he's not trying to, to show us uh, the real, real things uh, like really they are, like the scientists tell us they are, but what we are dealing with when we look at them. And of course, then it's indeterminate. It's not so clear, like in the definition of the scientist. And there is a lot of hesitation on what we should choose as being real, as being just an impression of it. What is what gives the sensation? Uh, so Cezanne is, in fact, dealing with this indetermination of reality. And uh, that's why he has to make so many decisions uh, to, to decide, well, OK, I will present the form this way or that way. Or there is another possibility. I could put my table less tilted and much more in perspective. Uh, all this has become kind of a free choice of the painter, in a way. Uh, we have the impression that this is not right because we know what is a color, we know what is a shape. Um, but in fact, we are relaying most of the time to habits. We don't look at things carefully like painters do. I, we have the, I always f try to find a wall. We, we think that the, the wall is all the same color, but if you look at it carefully, you will see there's, uh, because of the lighting, there's certain small difference. And of course, a painter, if he wants to paint what he sees, he will become to attach importance to his sensation, to what, the, what is really given to him. And he will see many colors where we see only one. Huh? Uh, there, there was a famous, uh, comparison done by Schopenhauer about Kant, he says, he says it, it's a little bit like somebody who wear green glasses all the time and think that the only color of the universe is green. But when he removes his glasses, you have this, the surprise to find the, that the world is full of colors. Uh, you could see with Cezanne, we remove the glasses. Uh, suddenly, we, we see that things are much less familiar, much less solid than we think. Uh, and indeed, at the end of his life, toward the end of his life, this process of decision become more and more uh, evident, I would say. In this view of the Mont uh, Saint-Victoire that he have produced, uh, we say always 90, 1902, 1906. Since he dies in 1906, that means, okay, it's really one of the last uh, work of Cezanne. You could say, okay, you can still maybe 
uh, make the shape of the Mont Saint Victoire itself, even if it's almost the same color as the background. Huh? But the foreground here seems to be very uh, tangled, very difficult to read. What is the foreground and then the middle ground and all this? All this seems to be given almost the same thing. As if also, at the same time that Cézanne discovered the indeterminacy, indeterminacy of reality, he discovered also that the pain that he used is indeterminate also. Uh, what he put on the canvas the, of coming from the tube is also just matter. You could do whatever with it. And there's a kind of coincidence like this. The world becomes more and more unfamiliar, more and more difficult to read, and, and more and more going toward a kind of uh, non-form, if you want. Uh, and this is why I think what happened with Cezanne, it is, I says he is a crossroad in modern art, because there's two possibilities from there. Or you go back to the form, like, like he did, and you decide to make forms and to give them uh, shapes and all that. Let's say uh, you could uh, put uh, in parallel, where is he? Oh, this is, doesn't fall. I had a Picasso there, okay, you have to believe me. Any Picasso will do. <laughs> the, uh, it will be one of the one of the solutions will be then to, uh, to go toward form, to create form. Uh, the uh, man as a kind of form builder, as, as somebody who decides what, what it will be. Or the other possibility is to go in the other direction and to go toward the inform, to non-form. Uh, and I wanted to put Picasso on the left and, and, uh, and uh, John Mitchell, for instance, on the right, just to give you an example of her work. Uh, uh, because with, with uh, let's say, Jackson Pollock and few others, and the Opel of the 50s, I think what they were fascinated what was with the other side uh, of, of the season proposition. Uh, not to, to go toward form, toward the more familiar things, but to go in the contrary toward the less familiar and toward the, uh, the non-form, if, if possible. Uh, and then, of course, this is more risky. This is more dangerous in a way. Uh, you don't know what will happen. You could end up with a kind of mess to, uh, that you, you look at a painting and it, it gives you nothing. You just seems to destroy everything, all the shapes that you are familiar with. Or you, you, you go to the, uh, to the assurance of, of form. Uh, it, it could, if you have read a little bit about Riopel, you may be surprised that I use Cezanne instead of Monet. Because indeed, uh, Monet was a. <laughs> what is he? Ah! No. I don't know. Okay. This is the Picasso that appeared for one second. I don't know. Where is he? Don't touch it. Ah, okay. So that was a good example. Okay. Why I, I, I chose this one is called Le Guéridon. It's in the, at the National Gallery in Ottawa. So uh, since it, it, you can see it, it's a more familiar one. What I wanted to oppose is this, is the two ways, uh, the two possibility. From Cézanne, you could go toward uh, a, a, a painter that will create form, or you have painters who will uh, explore the non-form. The, 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 and I think where, in fact, uh, 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 Riopel went also during the 50s. Uh, the, uh, the habitual reference, ah, okay, thanks to God. Stay there a little bit, <laughs> we never know what will happen. In, in French, I call it les moyens idiots manuels. Uh. <laughs> okay, I was saying that, you, you are nice to follow me, on. anyway. The, the, uh, I was saying that habitually, when, if you read about the Opel, the painter that we made allusion is not Cezanne so much that we refer to habitually, it's rather Monet. Uh, but then we have to be careful. W the Monet that interested Riopel in Paris and some of his American friends at the time, including John Mitchell, Sam Francis, uh, and few others, uh, it was the money of the end of the life of money, not the impressionist money that all, we all know, but really the money of Giverny, of, uh, of the, the last paintings, who are in a way very disturbing. You know that money at the time had a heavy case of cataract and was absolutely frightened to, to get operated. And I could understand it when I, I learned how they were doing the operation at the time. They, they, they used to call it needling. So they went with a needle, they just pierce your, uh, 
your cornea, and they, they push the, uh, the, the lens inside, and it falls in the eye somewhere, it's supposed to be high, <laughs> it falls there, and apparently with time it gets destroyed and, and dissolved like this. So when Monet learned, and, and more than that, the, the doctor that was supposed to operate him was called Monsieur Coutelat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kutla in French will be, uh, in English will be something not only a, a knife but will be a, like a, a saber right it's, it's something horrible and uh, so he said no 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 so he postponed of course the operation as much as he could one eye was better than the other he think all the time he was saying oh I, I see better this morning it's, it's wonderful it's healing a cataract will not heal it will just got improve uh, worse and worse and uh, so he resisted to it and not only that. He, he suffered also what we call xanthopia. Xanthopia, uh, if you know a little, uh, with Greek, xanthos means yellow. So there was a kind of yellowing of the cornea also, and that means even the color was transformed. Uh, and he, he thought that like Beethoven could play music uh, by, uh, even when he was deaf, he could paint also even blind in a way because he could read at least the, the name of the color of the tube and, and things like that. But in fact, that was not, he was correcting all the time these, these works. Huh? And Clemenceau used to visit him at the time and said, stop correcting, you destroy what you did. You, you made a masterpiece yesterday and you transform it, you, you are destroying what, what you did. So the, the, in fact, what Riopel and his friends were interested in, it is the period of, of Monet art where Monet was even obliged to not to relate any more on sensation. And he was dealing more and more with heavy impastos and correcting. This is the famous uh, Japanese foot bridge series. Huh? And if you don't know what it is, of course, it looks like completely abstract. And even, I don't have example of that, but if you go further from that, at the end, he made some Allée de Rose who looks almost like a, a kind of a mud, I would say, a purple mud with some very acid yellow appearing here and there. And a, a very, very difficult painting in a way, uh, almost abstract, but always with title like Allée de Rose, uh, uh, Pont Japonais, and everything, as if nothing happened. You know, they, they, they maintain a nénuphar and things like that. And what you see, it's kind of blurred like this completely. Uh, so they were fascinated by that because in a way, uh, these type of painting were putting in question the very idea of uh, relaying to your sensation and exploring something else, like exploring in form. Uh. So w what it is directly now in, in the, the, the painting of, uh, of uh, Riopel, first, it is paradoxical, this enthusiasm for Monet, when you think of his very first teacher, was called Henri Bisson. Uh, it's not a famous uh, painter, but he was probably a kind of amateur painter, but he was uh, very... Uh, realistic. Uh, the, the first lessons that Riopel received from this Bisson was to paint the things as they are. Uh, they were copying uh, uh, calendars uh, and reproduction, and they used to. And Bisson used to tell him, "Well, Monet, this is bad. This is not what you're supposed to do. This is terrible. The, the guy doesn't know how to paint." Uh, so it's paradoxical that it's Monet that uh, have uh, so interested uh, Riopel after. Um, then. Of course, the one who will open the eyes of uh, Riopel is Bordeaux, huh, because he will be a student at Ecole, Ecole du Meuble, in a furniture school. And Bordeaux was a great admirer of Cezanne. Huh? And you could say, well, the, uh, the suddenly the revelation of modern art, of what, what it is all about, could come from Bordeaux. But even then, the, there is a kind of automatist phase in uh, Riopel work, like, like this little uh, aquarelle could be a good example of it. It's called O oh, Mère, but uh, Oh My Mother, or something like that, uh, O oh, Mère in two, two words. And it belongs to the uh, to Francois Sullivan uh, collection. The, uh, this little, it, it's a little watercolor about that size. Okay, could illustrate a little bit this automatist uh, style of, of Riopel. But when he went in Paris, uh, very, uh, very soon, in, in 1950, he, he, uh, he participated then to uh, an exhibition uh, was called Vehemence Confronté. This is hard to translate, it's like uh, uh, each one being the confrontation of many uh, propositions uh, among painters. There was uh, a little painting of Pollock there. There was also Georges Mathieu or people like that. There were, it was in, in a gallery in France. Huh? And he produced, then Riopel produced a text 
And it's surprising because the Opel after will, will always uh, try to uh, look like a, a lumberjack and uh, a man who doesn't speak of art and all that. But in his early days in Paris, he thought it, it is good to, to write about your painting. And he says that automatism was uh, de passé. You know, what he was about now is to, to deal with pure hazard. But he, he associates hazard with consciousness. And this is interesting because it's exactly the way you will paint. You start a painting without, of course, any preconceived idea, like the automatist uh, used to say. But during the process of your painting, of the building of your painting, you are very much aware of what's happening. He says, this is why I could not have a witness when I paint, because it will be a distraction. And Riopelle at the time was known to be able to pass uh, 24 hours with a painting without interruption, without even realizing uh, what, what happened. He says hunters are like that also. They enter the woods and they lost the, <laughs> the conception of time. So I believe this. You see, when you are in the wood and looking for a moose, yeah, it's better not to think, oh, it's too late, we should go back. And <laughs> you, you have to find the moose. Huh? So this is the comparison he gave. And I think that, in a way, what he described is a kind of a, uh, a second, uh, second state of mind, a kind of in which you are so immersed in your, in your work, so conscious of it, so aware of what's happening, that you cannot be distracted and you cannot uh, do anything else. Huh? So he proposed uh, this thing. And what he reproached to uh, the uh, automatist uh, uh, style, in a way, was that he says, if you work only with the unconscious, and if you are not aware of what's happening on your canvas, the risk there it is that you will repeat the same gesture endlessly. And if you want, you could illustrate that with one of his early paintings, still under the influence of Automatis, with this one who's called the Green Parrot and the Perroquet Vert, and which is at the Museum of Quebec, in Quebec City. And in which you see uh, more or less what he says about the repetition of a gesture. So you have these little curves that are repeated all over the surface like this, and are, are are uh, uh, repeating themselves all the time like this. And the risk, of course, if you are not conscious of what you are doing, it is that you will go toward this uh, facile genre in which you could just repeat a, uh, an unconscious gesture many times. Uh, well, it will not stay there long, and will find finally, uh, very often, very, uh, I would say, uh, rapidly, his own style with these big abstraction. This one is called abstraction orange. And just. Uh, he gave a kind of a, just a color as the title, 1952. These are good example, of course, of a all over composition, like I was defining to you last time. A composition in which you have no focalization, no point where you can focalize your eyes specifically. Everything is more or less of the same interest. And also in which you don't have much of a hierarchy between the elements. This type of painting done in 52 in Paris was very surprising for the art critic in Paris because they were not used to that. They uh, call it a non-composition thing. Uh, and one of his friends, Georges Dutuy, who was a very uh, brilliant man and, very, and wrote beautiful texts about Riopel, uh, tried to describe the feeling he got in front of this type of painting. And he was saying, this is completely physical painting, meaning that's a painting done without the spirit, without the mind. Uh, he says, no, maybe this is too, too hard to say, I must say, but it's completely instinctive. It is as if we were at a stage when the sensations are not yet distinguished between themselves. Uh, and he says, you should put some empty space in which where thought could enter, uh, as if Riopelle was, was uh, making a painting in which l'esprit was completely uh, uh, excluded or removed from. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is an interesting reaction of a French critic in front of an all-over composition. When he will show that in New York, he will have no problem. Right away, people will, will compare this to Pollock, and they will find it a kind of a, a good example of uh, expressionism, abstract expressionism. Uh, the, the, the first uh, big show in which uh, Riopel was in New York was called Younger European Painter. And of course, he was presented there like a Parisian, uh, not, a, not at all a Canadian. Uh, he, he is from Paris, and, and he's among the younger European painter. The, uh, of course, the American avant-garde was very wary with this show. Uh, 
Africa because uh, this was revealing new people that nobody knew at the time too much uh, of after the war, uh, like people like Vols, like uh, Bram van Velde, uh, like Polyakov, Vera da Silva, and and the Americans said, oh, no, not again. So the School of Paris will, will, like a phoenix, will, will start from his ashes and will, will, uh, will, will uh, uh, invade us again. And they had, uh, of course, on the other hand, uh, there was after a younger American painter <laughs> show right away where uh, Greenberg says that uh, uh, Paris is dead and uh, uh, New York is alive and things like that. Uh, so it's exactly, and it's interesting to see that uh, Riopel was there at the time. Bordeaux, uh, at the same time, when Riopel was, uh, everybody speak of him in, in, in the press, uh, was showing at the Passe d'Oie Gallery. Nobody knows what Passe d'Oie is, where, and things. It was not an important gallery. It was her first show of abstract painting. She always presented much more uh, tame type of work, I would say. She was French, and that's uh, the reason, I think, that Bordeaux chose her, because he could speak uh, a French with her. And, but Rio Bell right away succeeded to get in the big show at the, at the, uh, the Museum of Modern Art with Sweeney catalog and things like that. And this is very typical of the, of the two uh, career, if you want. Uh, so that was a, an example. After <coughs> this, you have this type of painting like Autriche that you have here at the museum. Uh, in which you could say maybe he finally understood what Dutuy was telling him. Put some empty space uh, that in order that uh, the mind could enter and could, could find a place in this type of things. Uh. But in fact, even the emptiness, uh, apparent emptiness of that is full because as you know, he, he, all the paintings is covered with the same type of impastos. It just happened to be white instead of colored. But uh, uh, I don't think that uh, Riopel was so much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, giving, uh, giving in to, to uh, what Dutuy was proposing. Uh, the, uh, uh, and this period will end up with, probably with his masterpiece, which is called Pavan, and with, which is at the National Gallery in Ottawa. It's a huge painting that invades completely your field of vision. Uh, if you are about, I would say, six or seven feet from it, it's so big. Uh, each section will measure more than two meters, except the, the middle one, but the two big one on each side. And uh, it's about two meter high also, so it's, it's really big. It's a wall of paint, in a way. Uh, a little bit like in the Balzac novel of uh, Le Chef d'Oeuvre Inconnu, uh, the a wall of paint. And uh, with, I would say, maybe two movements uh, on the each side, it seems to go up, and in the middle, it seems to go down. So it's a very well organized, very well uh, satisfying type of painting. But also, I must add that this type of exploration of the non form is risky and dangerous. And you do have some composition of Riobel where you, you feel that he's losing ground, where the gesture take over, where the color get messed up, and, and, and suddenly you, you finish in a kind of uh, uh, not completely satisfying painting. Uh, to explore the non form is, is risky. Uh, because you, you, you are in the unknown, you are in the non-familiar, and you go on and on like this, and, and you, you may lose uh, your, your track. Okay. So first argument, I would say, why we were uh, astonished by the last painting, it is because we remember these things. Maybe we, we didn't have complete explanation, but we used to like them, and I, I, I think the reason why we like them is this, because they, they are exploring another side of reality, and, uh, and they were, most of them were satisfying. But when we go to the recent stuff, this is a photo of uh, Holy Opel, uh, painting with a spray can, uh, it's, uh, it's not an imagination, so meaning that he, he worked also on a table like this. The big work, the homage to Rosa Luxembourg, was done on a table, meaning with two rolls. It's a little bit like a Torah, you know, in the, in the, in the synagogue. You have a roll here and a roll there, and you just go like this, and you read only a part of it. Huh? So he was painting just a part of it, not never seeing the whole work together. That's why it's narrative, in a way. You could deal with one scene after the other. There's no known uh, uh, chronological sequence between each scene. Huh? Uh, probably uh, one after the other, when you feel like it, or you remember something, and you improvise from, from that. There's no sequence, let's say, a chronological sequence. The, uh, 
the effect, of course, is of that nature. Uh, you, you realize that he could use a lot of things, birds, but also even a whore of, of, a, of a canoe on the left there, uh, other uh, objects, anything that fell on his hand that was put on a canvas and then sprayed over and then removed. Huh? So he ob obtained, uh, and this is the, of course, the meaning that I, I was intended when I speak of impression negative. Huh? It's like uh, if you put an object and you spray above it and you remove the object, you get a negative impression of the object. Uh, that's the, the way he was, uh, he was working. And it is this, of course, this usage that right away uh, make an allusion to uh, uh, I would say an aspect of our modern life that's not so sympathetic, the graffiti. Yeah? And not the graffiti of, uh, of the whole, the graffiti as you see them in the, in the city of today. Uh, and especially uh, in Concordia, we have a, a lot of graffiti around. <laughs> we are building a new tower there somewhere, and we have this beautiful graffiti. On, there was a York Theater also was full of them. Anyway, we, we see we are not far from them. And this is what we think when we see the, the recent Riopel things. And indeed, I, I wanted to, uh, to evoke that uh, to you uh, by a few photos. There was a time, but it's no more like that, thanks God. There was a time when New Yorker used to go in their subway and say, you live in New York. Uh, so that means at the, at the morning you have the red eyes already from the pollution and you just drink what they call their coffee. I, I don't know what it is, but they call this coffee. <laughs> and uh, so you enter in a subway and then you see all the cars are like that, you know, with full of graffitis some of them almost to the, to the windows, and they change every day in all this. You go, uh, uh, some of them are, are so uh, obtrusive that they cover the window. You know, here, here you, when you were in the car, you cannot see anything. Uh, you, you just see uh, paint. And uh, so at, at the beginning, people were, were annoyed by that, but at a certain point, they got scared by this. There was too much of it uh, every, every time. And indeed, you could ask yourself, how they did that? How they managed? So the system was very simple. They actually, they bought the can first, but they don't bought it, they steal them. Uh, so much that the merchant around the uh, metro, around the subway, decided not to offer them anymore. They, they could not get paid for it enough. So, they, so people were just stealing them and going. They enter in the metro by night, and they were in the station, the main station, when the metro closed. Uh, and then they had eight hours in front of them to work, <laughs> in peace. Uh, so they come habitually with little drawings, preparatory drawings, because what you see habitually on these things is what we call a tag. Uh, the tag is basically a signature, uh, yeah, uh, so it's few letters. Uh, we know the, the name of uh, some of these guys, Dusty Shadow. Uh, this is wonderful to make. Uh, uh, another was called A1 Steph. Uh, I guess uh, Stefan or something. Not Tech Days. Each one have, have his name. This is his tag. And so he made huge letters, balloon them, paint them uh, the most uh, outrageous color. And this is basically what the works is all about. Uh, then in the morning, this is, the, this is great. You see, think of it in terms of diffusion de l'art. Uh, all the cars are starting all over New York, local one, uh, from west to east, Harlem to, to, to the Statue of Liberty. They go at the speed of light in every direction, and your, your masterpiece are going like this to the view of millions of people. No museum can, can compete with you. Uh, <laughs> and so the, I could imagine for these guys, it was, it was a fantastic trip. Uh, but like I told you, the, the public didn't appreciate it too much. The, uh, so the um, modern transport uh, authority of the, uh, the Metro Transport Authority of New York uh, have a change of uh, direction and the new director decided to, to stop that. Uh, so now the, the Metro is not very clean, but at least there's no more graffiti like before. They, they, uh, they succeeded to stop them and things like that. And uh, so the, the people uh, are not confronted to that. So when you think of it, what Riopel, oh yeah, I wanted to show you one, to show you that some of them had some philosophical uh, uh, 
uh, thing. You see, what is art? Why is art? Of course, this is a very crucial question. In fact, the, the, the New Yorker thought that the, the metro was uh, going to the gangs, but it, it's not true at all. The, the graffiti are done by a very little number of people, and they are in competition with one with the other. One of them uh, call it the Styles War. Uh, the, the, the war of styles. Uh, and it's exactly that. They are, let's see, maybe 10 people at the most, and they are in competition with one of the other. As if the famous individualism of modernism was going to the street, and I would say even underground. Uh, this is why it's not so far from the modernist uh, 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 approach, because after all, modern painter also are very egoistic, uh, they affirm themselves, very authoritarian, and all it. The modernism uh, understood in his, uh, uh, in his uh, precise uh, meaning, uh, like opposed to postmodern, if you want. And this type of uh, attitude in which the painter is an individual who creates, who is original, and all that, they are exactly that, except that they bring it to the level of the street. And that's why. What Riopel was doing was one of the tactics or the strategy that's very typical of, modern, of the modernist period. It is to take an aspect of low art and to make high art with it, yeah? to transform it from low art to high art. I could illustrate this with a with, uh, with few examples. Let's say, for instance, Picasso made this painting in 1912, and it's called uh, landscape with posters, and, and indeed you can see here uh, uh, K-U-B for cub, cube in French, uh, it will be a, a little cube that it were used for soup, it's a, like Lipton soup, if you want. and you have Léon, of course, he was a seller of hat and things like that, and uh, you, you could uh, maybe put in, I could put in parallel a street of Paris at the time with cube with the same. Uh, so this is, of course, um, you could say a form of low art. It's an advertisement, basically. And it's used in a context of a cubist painting and uh, redeemed, in a way, brought to a high art level. And this is, I tell you, a tactic that you find many times in, in, uh, in the modernistic uh, period. Another example of the same thing, Fernand Léger. Uh, um, calling the, this painting Le Siphon, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of, uh, what do you say, Siphon? Siphon, uh, why to look? And uh, look the source of it, it's very, very close. So he went, not only he went to advertisement, but to a find a very low grade of advertisement. Advertisement that you will find in a newspaper, in black and white like this. Uh, and indeed, it's very close to it, as if he didn't change too much, except maybe the background. And he put his own style in it. But there is a kind of relation there between uh, what is uh, shown there. And I, I thought to myself, uh, another example of that, of course, is the usage they made of uh, so-called primitive art. Uh, this is of the same nature, and it's not very, <laughs> very uh, polite or very uh, respectful of this uh, type of art. Uh, it is considered like a form of low art that you could bring to the uh, Occidental style. Uh, also, they were using African masks or Oceanian works, exactly the same thing. And Riopel himself did that with the famous series of Les Ficelles. Uh, well, it is based on... Um, <laughs> games that uh, Inuit people used to do with some uh, ropes like this that you put between two hands and you change their, their form and you create like this animals and plants and everything that you want to express. So Riopel was fascinated by that and make a series of pictures like this one is called La Danse, the, the dance, uh, which is uh, exactly the same type of uh, utilization. The problem it was for him was to try to find something that others have not done. Uh, so the, uh, probably the Inuit source was less exploited, and especially not the Ficelle. So he thought, OK, this is interesting. I, I will do something that uh, nobody has done before. But, but you see, the relation with the graffiti is the same type. It is a kind of form of low heart that you try to bring to a higher level in, uh, in, in, in museum context or things. I, I was asking myself, can we find people who are much closer to the graffiti than uh, these examples? And I, I thought, of course, uh, right away of Dubuffet, because Dubuffet, uh, first of all, I, I make my PhD on Dubuffet, so he's like a uh, kind of a <laughs> hanging, 
hanging presence in my life. Uh, Dubuffet had this idea that uh, to renew art, you have to go against culture. You have to, to find anti-cultural works. And he was interested in, in graffiti for a while, but the graffiti as you find them in Paris, not at all like the graffiti that we have here. The, Paris uh, have, is such a dirty city. You know, it's a, the, the walls are gray. Uh, the, a full of soot that, that have been accumulated for centuries, and, and people don't clean them because you will destroy the monument. You know, be careful. When Malraux decided to, to clean the Louvre, there was a big uproar. You see, it should, La Crasse should stay there. You see the dirt, because it protects the wall. Okay. But with this system, you could scratch in the walls your, your graffiti. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Brassai, the, the famous photographer, did photos of these uh, scratch graffiti. You see, and this, of course, what Dubuffet tried to imitate. He lived at the time uh, near Rue Mouffetard, where they have you have tons of them everywhere, and they were kind of very low grade type of graffiti. And uh, so this one, one of an exploitation, but they have nothing. Then you realize that what Riopel is dealing with is not this type of thing. It's not this. I would say classy one, but more to the, the real tough one, the, the, the one we see in Metro and, and in, in the city of today. Uh, uh, the, another paint, an American painter also who have used this type of scribbling, if you want, is Cy Twombly. And Twombly use it almost as the, the graffiti that you will see in toilets or something like, it, it looks like dirt in a way, but he give to them beautiful title like Bacchanalia for this one. And uh, so as if he was playing against with culture, but in a different, completely different way of uh, Riopel. In fact, I thought Riopel in spirit is closer to pop art. Huh? Pop art have not used graffiti as such so much, but they have used, uh, they have the, this relation with, for instance, with Liechtenstein, the relation with comic strip who is very close to what, what Riopel want to do with the graffiti. Huh? This is a picture by Liechtenstein and this is his source. Huh? We know even the name of the, the man who draw this comic strip. I was called Mr. Habruzzo. And you can imagine he was not very happy when he saw that in a gallery for a few uh, thousand of dollars when he was selling his comic strip for 25 cents. And uh, he sued Liechtenstein uh, for that. He says, you copy me, I'm the creator, and you just, uh, and uh, there's a lot of discussion, it's an interesting discussion, and it's a good case in which a uh, form of art is considered like low, like a comics, uh, comic strip, is brought in the context of museum, big painting, done with special color, few, uh, just little modification, like for instance, the color of the air. And the reason for that, it is in a comic strip, you have to use your black in a, in a, uh, in a kind of uh, clever way. If you put too much of them, your page looks ugly uh, because you have all these little images. So sometimes they decide some of the girls have to have black hairs to make some contrast also. But for, for of course, for Lishan Sign, this was much better to put uh, a blonde, you know, since she said, that's the way it is. It should have begun, but it's hopeless. And uh, of course, the, the title of the painting is hopeless. Uh, and and uh, another example, uh, where I don't care, I'd rather sing than call Brad for help. <laughs> no, dear, call Brad. <laughs> it's not worthwhile, <laughs> this bastard, just to drop. And, and here, you see the, uh, uh, here you see the cover of the comic strip that uh, Liechtenstein used also. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, in a way, the relation of, of Riopel with the graffiti is, is closer to these uh, pop art example, and you could even make a case of a reverse influence. Here is a graffiti, of course, who is who's quoting, who's quoting Warhol. Uh, so you, you can see there's a circular uh, type of, it, it's not so much an influence, like a dialogue between the two forms of uh, this guy of, uh, of some culture. <laughs> he, he showed us, uh, he called pop soup. Uh, he have created a Fred soup because it's done by his friend Fred. We, we, we know only the, and the others that you can read them. And of course, it alludes the famous Campbell Soup series of, uh, of Warhol. Uh, uh, so the, the, this kind of uh, problem can go in, in two directions. When you, okay, this, I can I make a kind of general case with that. When you go closer to the Riopel uh, painting and you look at them more carefully, 
you see, that, okay, he uses spray can, he uses shapes that seem to be taken like this, uh, like, like, he works like these graffitis, except that the, uh, the technique is not exactly like, like theirs. The first thing that you realize it is he used real birds, for instance, in these two examples, one is called Mascarade and the other Manitou, of 1990, uh, almost contemporary with the homage to Rosa Luxembourg. He used real birds that he put on the, on the board. Of, uh, this is two boards of, of wood on each uh, case that are okay, put flat on a table, spray them over, and then remove the birds. And I used to ask him, so what do you do with the birds? So we eat them. <laughs> well, as if it was a stupid question, you know, that, uh, what do you do with, with, with uh, a geese or with a goose? He said, you eat them. Uh, yeah, but full of, uh, anyway. And, the, uh, <laughs> and uh, so it could be the same birds as used, uh, put in different shape. And, and then what he obtained is, is very specific. Is a one, it, it's a way to create a shape without using a line to, to co of contour. Huh? And it's one of the rare ways to do this. There's not too many ways to make a shape without using a line. Huh? And even the, the, the ancient used to, to tell the story how painting started. And they used to think of the line also, because uh, apparently uh, Pliny uh, tell the story. Uh, it was uh, a shepherd who, who was uh, bored and had nothing to do. And with a stick, he used to trace his shadow on the ground. And when he detached himself, he had the first painting. And then there was a variation of that also, that the uh, couple uh, were very much in love, and the girl was going away, and the man traced her shadows on the wall to keep a memory of her face. But in both cases, you have a line. Uh, the, the, the beginning of painting is described by a line. So what, in a way, what uh, Riopel is trying to tell us, maybe the beginning of painting is even more primitive than that. We're going much further than that, and in which we, we don't use even a line. We just, you, we get a contour, but we get a kind of an empty shape, a kind of absence. And this is important because, in a way, when Riopel comes back to figuration, it doesn't come back to the line. And he came back to figure who are, in fact, absent, uh, who are like negative. Uh, and uh, OK, he reintroduced figuration, but as absent. Uh, and when you think also of, uh, finally, of the implication of the big work, Rosa Luxembourg, is about the death of one of his friends, OK, that also make another connection interesting in a way that uh, you are dealing with death, you are dealing with absence. We are dealing with somebody who is no more there. Uh, so all this becomes to be more and more uh, solid in a way. And indeed, you have in modern art people who are work close to what Riopel did that, using negative impression. One of them was suggested to me by Jean-René Ostigui, who is a friend and an uh, art critic. And he told me, he says, you should look maybe to what Yves Klein did. OK, you probably pronounce Klein, but the French call him Klein. Uh, I don't know about Yves Klein. Uh, Yves Klein, let's say, who is famous for his famous blue, uh, the, the, the painting, all blue painting and all that. He did, for, maybe some of you have seen this old movie, it was called Mondo Cane, in which we see a scene that taken from what I'm showing that with the bad slides. The, uh, what he did, he asked um, some models to paint themselves with color, with blue, and to roll themselves on the canvas. Huh? So what you see there, it's the aftermath of the, <laughs> of the painting because it's their feet la, that you see. It, it must be a very dirty proposition. The poor girls have to, to wash themselves fast after, not to dry with this, it would be horrible. And during the, the performance, he, he had a cellist uh, playing what he called La Symphonie Monotone, uh, why? Because it's, it was one note uh, done by about an hour, like this, the same note, uh, to create the atmosphere. And he himself was in blue smoking and all, all, uh, all dress uh, and directing the girls, okay, roll there, roll there, do that, do that. Okay. What you obtain, of course, with this, in fact, it's a positive impression. Huh? If I put paint on my hand and I go on the wall, I will not have what Riopel did. Huh? I will have a, a, a positive impression. Like, for instance, this one is called Anthropometry uh, by Yves Klein. He, he, he call all of them, he give them numbers and all that. Some of them are much closer to uh, what Riopel did because you have the two system here. 
you have the, the blue shape in the middle is done by positive impression, but the shape on the, this part here is negative impression, exactly like Riopel did. Yeah? This is, this is uh, it's called the vampire, and all these pa the painting of Yflin is the beginning of the 60s, about, in, in uh, the period. Um, some of them are more ambitious in size, like, of course, the, the personages, you see them are real, uh, real personages, so it's real size life. And uh, it's called, uh, the, he gave uh, an English title for that, People Begins to Fly. Because, of course, if you put them on the ground like this, you could give them any shape you want, and you could suggest like them that, that they are flying. But you see that he feels the need also to fill the empty form, uh, to put some colors inside here and, and to, to complete it. One of the most... Uh, disturbing uh, and more efficient, in a way, uh, version of, of this series of Yves Klein is this one who's called Hiroshima. Because you know that after the, when the atomic bomb uh, had created, one of the effects, it was to leave in the walls of some building the shadows of people who were around. There's nothing left of them except the shadow, a little bit like you see in this uh, painting of Yves Klein. Uh, so there is some relation here with what Riopel do, but in another context, in, uh, with uh, another type of intention. Uh, uh, I thought also of uh, some photographer, uh, because people like Man Ray, for, for instance, have made photos who are done without apparatus, with, without a Kodak, if you want, and consist to put object on photographic paper and then to illuminate the paper and then to remove the object after. So exactly like Yopel uh, used to do. So you, you, you obtain that way what Man Ray called a rayogram, uh, the, or rayograph, of, it's a, it's a, in, in which you could say, uh, instead of a spray of paint, you have photon, uh, you have photon who are uh, thrown on, the, ca on the, the paper instead of the canvas. But basically, you have the same, same idea. And this technique was used uh, very early, uh, at, almost at the beginning of photography also, by a man uh, called uh, Christian Schad. Uh, uh, this, uh, and it was called Shadograph, uh, playing with the word shadow, of course, by Tristan Tzara. And this one was done in 1918, so much, much before Man Ray. And again, it's interesting, but it doesn't have the, the, the power of uh, what Riopel did uh, with, with a, a similar technique, if you want, uh, because there you feel it's like tentative a little bit. With Riopel, you feel that it's a language. It's, it's really assumed as a language, both subversive. Uh, that's why we were so shocked when we see them for the first time, and also profound, and also going toward uh, many layers of meaning. Uh, and in fact, maybe what it's all about, <coughs> after all, it is um, uh, the, very, the very beginning of painting. Uh, and I could not, not think when I saw this, uh, this is the first scene of uh, homage to Rosa Luxembourg, I could not, not think of some prehistoric uh, drawings. Uh, in which you have this idea of a negative impression of hands, in particular. Uh, uh, this type of presentation you do find in south of France and north of Spain. Uh, and one of the most famous one is called the uh, Cave of Gargas, in which you have maybe, well, it's hard to calculate exactly, but maybe 100 of these hands, like this stencil, on the ground. And uh, the technique they use uh, is, is well known. Uh, they probably or put the paint in their mouth and just blow it like this on, on uh, putting their hands on the wall. And the wall was being a little bit wet. And that's why most of them are in reddish color like this, because we know that they use also black pigment, was done by manganese uh, pigment. But this black pigment didn't hold well on the wall and habitually fall. But the hematite that they use, or the red ochre that they use, like in this case, uh, was ochre already, was almost a limestone, if you want, itself. So it stick to the wall very well. And that's why most of them are red like this. Uh, there's a possibility also that they use even a little reed, 
uh, and they, they, should, uh, they should blow through it and, and did exactly. Uh, L'Abbé Breuil, who was a famous prehistorian, used to speak of aerograph, huh? like uh, exactly that, the reed in which you could blow painting and obtain this thing. In Gargas, the, uh, there is some disturbing element because when you look at them closely, the hands are never complete. They lack fingers. They lack, uh, in certain cases, even uh, one phalange and uh, one uh, others, uh, the, the thumb seems to be cut and things like that. And first, uh, the first impression we had is, oh, this is a horrible ritual, maybe where they cut fingers of people. Uh, in prehistory, you, you can have as much as imagination as you want because nobody will check you. And the, uh, so then a, a clever guy came and said, no, no, it's not that, it's much simpler. He says, why do you think that they put their hand like this? Why not like this? And then you could fold your fingers as much as you want and obtain maybe the same effect. Huh? So when you look back to them carefully, you see that this is not possible either. Because first of all, how could you fold one phalange? How do you phalange? Phalange? Joint, one joint. Huh? How can you fold only one? You cannot. Habitually, on always a little bit of another come with it. Huh? First thing. Second thing, some of them, if, if we look carefully, maybe it's hard to see on this schema, but uh, the, the, um, the part that remains there is not tapered like this. It's a little bit more wide. Huh? And uh, as if really it, it's a badly eel uh, type of wound. Then the other hypothesis, of course, that, we, that was uh, brought, it is maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's people like lepers or something like that that lose uh, part of their fingers. And in a way, what Gargas was about, it was an imploration. You see, the whole uh, po little population there was attacked by this epidemic, and they, they put their hand on the walls to pray the gods uh, to, to save them from that. Huh? The problem with this explanation, which seems logical also, it is that uh, you find these hands all over the world, and not only in the south of France, but so if it's an epidemic, it, it's really a, a colossal one. For instance, this is an example uh, found in Australia, which is exactly like, like the other one. You, you cannot really distinguish one from the other. It's the same idea, the same system. Maybe there the hand is complete, but you, you do have also other mutilated hands and... Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes also you could have a positive impression, like in this uh, Chauvet uh, cave in France that I've <coughs> recently discovered, but whatever uh, the context then again. And that's why the hypothesis of a, of a, mu a voluntary mutilation came back as a possibility. And indeed, it seems that it's used in certain tribes when, uh, uh, a, per when a person uh, is dead, the, in, in order to remind the, the place of this person, they cut the, fi the, the joint of uh, uh, the finger of some of the member of the tribe, and they keep memory of that, as if uh, one, one joint for each relative, and each relative a joint. <laughs> so <laughs> this is... <laughs> And okay, so I said to myself, well, maybe all this is, is interesting, but it's not very relevant to what uh, Riopel wanted to do uh, in his big work. Uh, it, it is in a way, because if it deals with death, if it is like a memorial of death, you could say, okay, th this has a certain connection. But when you go back to the, to the picture themselves, you see that it, it represents very often these, these birds. Okay, they can symbolize whatever you want, the, the, the person uh, that he's uh, uh, lamenting about, but they are, they are basically birds. And around them, what we see, it's a world that has nothing to do with the world of the birds. Huh? It is, for instance, this thing come, uh, this is the Riopel uh, with an amateur of cars, of course. Uh, this is a fan huh, that's inside of a car. And you have nails here, you have uh, bolts, uh, you have uh, maybe uh, uh, some other shapes, uh, to nails again there, uh, a whore, uh, whatever seems to, to fell on, on his hand. And then, if you, if you think of it, there's, there's an opposition here of an animal who is in fact hunted, uh, who is dead, and is represented by an empty uh, form. And on the other hand, the world in which uh, things will have signification for him if he was alive is not his world. It's a world of, 
uh, absurd in a way, who have more human quality than animal quality. Uh, an animal is, 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 in a way, is without ego, without consciousness on one hand, and on the other hand, without a real world. Uh, Heidegger used to say is welt loss, is without a world. And he referred to this idea that uh, the relationship of an animal with his world is not like ours, it's not uh, like a kind of uh, objective relationship. It's uh, a relationship in which you are triggered by a certain stimulus and you are, de you are dealing only with this. The rest doesn't exist much. Huh? I see that with my dogs, though he's old. He passed the day sleeping or just looking like this and not doing anything. But the moment the refrigerator opens, this is a releaser of inhibition. Then he comes alive and he comes to, to, to eat. Uh, this is the only language that he's interested in uh, at uh, 12 or two, I don't know how old he is. But, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, OK, so that means there's a kind of uh, uh, very specific relation with the world, but also not a real ego, not a real subject inside. Uh, like these famous zoologists uh, who at school uh, used to say, there's no such a thing in the animal world as an object, uh, as something that could have signification in outside of what is important to me for my survive or not. Uh, uh, you know, for instance, that the, even a, a chick of a gull, the moment he's born, is already uh, programmed to react to anything who is narrow, who is, uh, will look like a pen in a way, and will go like this uh, from left to right, right to left, and will have a little red spot. Uh, this is exactly what you see on the beak of his mother. Uh, but if you do it with, with a pencil, he will go to the pencil. Habitually, it's even better for him, so, because it's, it's closer to the type of stimulus with which he, he reacts. Uh, I want to say, that, so then, by using the symbol in a way, Riopel is suggesting that the, 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 the dead person is like lost, is like no more a subject. And his world have no more signification since her lost. Uh, as if he was uh, making a kind of reflection on animal life, but also giving it a, a kind of a more metaphysical type of dimension. Maybe I, I, I lent a lot of meaning to Riopel. But, uh, but there's the fact that we are dealing with painting who used this kind of empty shape in a context which is very peculiar, in the context of the death of, of his uh, friend, and uh, in which uh, uh, you could say you, you deal with the language, you deal with uh, uh, what was tentative before him, the, the little uh, graffiti of Dubuffet or the Yves Klein uh, anthropometry or the photo of Man Ray and all this, what is more, more and more tentative now becomes a subversive language, that's why it shocked us, and also a very uh, profound one. Okay. Thank you.